for, for me, the phases of meditation, uh, social meditation are something that I discovered not in the beginning of doing it, but rather as I learned it and began to teach it and so forth. Especially as I started doing facilitator trainings, it became important to say, what is this exactly? How does it work? What's the structure of it? And it seemed to me pretty obvious that there was a very simple structure, um, these basic phases that we move through when we do the practice. And the first phase is the setup phase. We're actually setting up the practice and making sure that everyone who's participating has an idea about what exactly we're doing here together. Um, it's very difficult if you go into something like, especially a social experience where you're being asked to do things that are not very normal, typical. Uh, if you don't know what's happening, particularly if you're a certain kind of person like myself, who tends to be more analytical and you know likes to, to know everything, <laughs> if you have that affliction, then it's very uncomfortable when uh, you're just thrown into a new experience and you don't know what's happening. So uh, actually the setup phase is really just to, it's to give the conceptual mind um, some idea of what, what to expect, you know, and what to do. And then of course the, um, we don't actually know what's gonna happen, um, but you know, it's, it's nice to think we do. So that's the purpose of the setup phase is to, to give people a, a false sense of security. <laughs> Um, it, there's more to it than that. And then the second phase is we do the practice, you know, we actually do it. Um, and then the third phase, we reflect on how it went. And so uh, I want to talk a little bit about each of these phases and what the core, to me, what some of the core, the most important aspects of the phase are. Um, so in the setup phase, and I'd say this is the most complex phase as a facilitator. Um, we're doing several things that are very important. One is we're sharing the instructions. So we're telling people about how to do the practice. Uh, and each practice has its own unique set of instructions. So obviously that it implies that we understand the practice to be able to share the instructions. We obviously need to have some idea of what it is we're doing. Um, although we don't have to be, you don't have to be masters at it to share the instructions because the instructions are also pretty clear, um, as you saw in the, the slide that I shared. Um, the other thing we need to do as a facilitator, um, I think this is crucial, is to not just talk about the instructions, but also to demonstrate the practice. So here, this is a, another way of looking at how people learn, really. This is about pedagogy, about learning teaching. Um, we learn not just from relating to abstract concepts, but we also learn from watching how people do things. That's actually probably the first way we learn, right? When we first come into this world, um, you know, we don't have access to abstraction yet. Um, we just observe and we're aware and we're in the situation and we see what's happening. And then we, you know, we, we copy, you know, we copy what we see and we test. Um, so the demonstration is, it, it speaks to, I'd say, an older, deeper part of us that is kind of constantly looking around and seeing how things work. So we demonstrate the practice, we show what it's like. And I, I did that um, in the previous practice, freestyle noting, I did that uh, doing a solo demonstration. So I showed you what it was like for me to do it out loud. Uh, as a facilitator, you could also do a group demonstration. So if you're doing a practice that involves three to four people, and you wanna demonstrate what it's like, you could also invite a couple of volunteers to do the practice with you for a minute or two. So you can actually show what it looks like to do the, the practice in its, in its full form. Um, I would say that's, it's not required to do that, but to me, the, some kind of demonstration is critical um, that, that you find some way to demonstrate the practice so people can see what it looks like before doing it. Especially helpful if someone's new to the practice but it's also helpful for experienced practitioners, you know, just to be reminded. Um, so we share the instructions, we demonstrate the practice. The other thing we do as facilitators in the setup phase is we introduce the safety release valve and the witness. And these are two important parts of the instructions or just kind of reminders about how you can participate. And the safety release valve, um, in almost every practice, there is this option. There's a couple exceptions like binary noting, you know, where you're choosing between one of two things. 
Uh, I don't mention the safety release valve there because I want people to feel the pressure <laughs> of having to pick between one of two things. Uh, and some practices where we're just saying one thing, like just noting, um, it's usually not re um, required or recommended. But most practices, if there's any sense that people are going to be like, I'm not sure what to say because there's so many options, then you could um, then you could introduce the safety release valve. You can say pass or don't know or uncertain or just thank you. Um, that helps take the pressure off and is um, particularly welcoming to the part of us that doesn't always know what's going on. It's like, oh yeah, you don't have to always know. Not knowing is part of this game too, definitely. Uh, and then the witness, um, this is um, an important role. I discovered this really through trial and error um, and realizing as I wanted to share all this cornucopia of new techniques and practices that maybe not everyone is interested in participating out loud <laughs> with everything I come up with. Um, and so I found it's quite helpful actually to, to have a designated role of the witness of someone, a, a position you can be in where if you don't feel comfortable doing the instructions out loud, you can still participate, you can still witness. And this ends up being really helpful in a lot of other ways too. Um, if someone, for instance, is joining in on a session online and they're in commute, they're commuting. I've had this happen many times where folks are in a taxi or a bus or, you know, they're, they're driving. Usually they're not actually driving, but they're like in the passenger seat, um, you know, or, or biking home or whatever. You can participate. You just, you know, just it's good, better to witness if you're um, in the middle of a crowded, you know, sub, sub, uh, subway system or whatever. So the witness ends up being really helpful for a lot of reasons. And to me too, it gives people who have experience with silent meditation, solo meditation, and who are very comfortable with that, but are new to social meditation. It gives them a way to participate that's familiar. Um, it's like there's, there's a way in. And there doesn't have to be this huge gap between solo silent meditation on the side and social meditation where everyone's doing everything out loud on the side. There's a bridge. The witness is a bridge between these paradigms as well. So that's why I always introduce it. Um, and that's part of what we do in the setup phase is we invite people to be a witness. Lastly, and I think this is maybe the most important thing, if you don't do anything, this is probably the most important thing to do, is to see if there are any questions about the instructions before you begin. Um, so you heard as I was sharing the freestyle noting technique, I asked a few different times if there were any questions. And I asked right before we began, um, because I want to make sure if there are any questions, people aren't uncertain about some aspect of the instructions, that they get a chance to, to voice that and to, to ask their question. And um, I've just found that's very helpful. Again, giving, giving the mind what it needs, which is some sense of clarity about what we're doing. Um, so yeah, answering questions is important and making it the last thing one does, I think is really useful because then there's no question for us as a facilitator that all the questions have been responded to if, if there are none before we start. So that's it. That's the setup phase. And that can be done quite quickly, depending on the complexity of the practice. You could do that in just a few minutes actually, or it could take a little longer. I usually find about five to 10 minutes is what I need to set up a practice. And then we can do the practice. That's the second phase. We just do it. Um, as a facilitator in this practice, I set up breakout rooms. We went into the breakout rooms. If you're in a physical space together, you might you know, invite people to get into their you know, groups and then begin. Um, you might find it helpful to ring a bell. That's not required, but I, I do that as part of my facilitation just to indicate the start. And then the actual practice itself, here the important point to me is that the facilitator participates in the practice, is one of the participants. Um, and this is important because one, it gives us information about how the practice went um, by being part of it. We can actually see how effective our instructions were <laughs> or weren't. Um, and then two, it reinforces this fundamental idea of, in social meditation that we're all peers, that we're all doing this together. Um, this is a peer-to-peer -peer form of practice. 
So the facilitator is a special kind of peer, you could say is a peer with privileges, um, in that everyone is looking to the facilitator um, for information, more so than they are looking to each other, especially during the setup phase. Um, and so the facilitator isn't exactly a normal kind of peer, but by participating in the practice, instead of just sending everyone away to do it, and then they come back and report, you actually are demonstrating that you are part of the practice, that, you're, that you are a peer, that you're in this together. Um, and it's just great for deepening one's own practice to participate. Um, but this isn't always how it works, you know, with meditation teachers, especially, um, oftentimes teachers will give instructions, students will go off and do it and then come back. And they're, um, and that's totally fine. I do that as well sometimes, but, but it creates a gap. It creates a vertical gap between the teacher and the student, uh, a difference between us. And that can actually be useful. That difference it can be utilized in a, in a, in a, in a skillful way, but it can also be harmful. It can be problematic. It can create this sense of like a big difference between you and I, like we're totally different people totally different capacities. It's like, no, pretty much every meditation teacher around the world throughout space and time knows <laughs> that that's not true. Um, we're just, we're normal people and we have the same stuff going on. So uh, it's good to, to, I think in this practice, um, <laughs> embed that understanding in the actual instructions and, and the way it flows. So we, we participate in the practice. And then when it's over, we do a debrief. This is the last phase. We, we check in to see how did it go. And sometimes it's just simple as that. How did it go? Um, here we did a quick debrief together where we just shared a few words on how it went. And uh, I said there was settling, confusion, and flow. Okay, that's what predominated for me in the session. Everyone gets a chance to share what it was like for them. We get to hear each other's experience. Because although in the practice, we did the practice together, um, we might not have all been in the same group and we might not have completely and fully understood what was happening for each other, right? So the debrief phase gives us some sense of what's happened as participants and as a facilitator. As a facilitator, this is super important too, because if I um, want to take care of the folks who've come into practice with me, if I, um, if I sense there's something really could be off or problematic, uh, in the debrief, I'm going to get some sense of that and I can follow up with that person either during the debrief phase or, or later on. So it's, it's useful to, and I think critical to know how things went for folks. Um, there's also the possibility, and we'll get into this as we go, of a more extended debrief, you know, where you have more time to just check in and talk about how it went to share what it was like, um, to ask folks questions as a facilitator, to see what their experience was like with, in more detail. Um, there's lots of techniques and tools we can use as facilitators to, um, to support a more um, effective debrief round where there's a, a more of a sense of learning from the experience. This is kind of how we learn. We do something and then we reflect on how it went. Um, and in that reflecting is a lot of the learning that happens. Um, sometimes something power, profound and powerful can happen and then we just go on with our day and we forget about it. It becomes just some other, uh, just another experience. I remember one day, and this is on the opposite side, but I remember one day I was running across this busy intersection near my home and uh, all of a sudden this truck went whizzing by my face. I stopped just in time, my sandal and one of my feet fell off and the truck rolls, just goes right over top of it. It would have gone right over top of me had my body not stopped. And it was so interesting to notice that like by the time I got across the road after that near death experience, uh, within about a minute, my mind was just thinking about what was for lunch. <laughs> I was like, what's for lunch? And it can be like that here too, you know, in this practice. If, if we don't take time to reflect on something, it can just become like this thing that just happened that we don't, it, it, and it just whizzes by, you know, even you could miss your own near death and, and uh, not even reflect on the profundity of that. Um, so, so it's important, I think, to, to take some time to reflect. And that's the debrief phase. So these are the phases of social meditation, um, the phases we go through as participants and also as facilitators 
you know, um, it's important to know kind of how things flow.